you know, in, in the in, in the hours. So, but uh, eventually, all of you will be graded. Okay, and then uh, it just will be on black. You can go back and check uh, both um, the numerical scores and then my comments on your scores. All right, and then after that happens, as with any evaluation, if you want to email me, um, ask me how a chance to take a deep breath, uh, or if you want to come see me uh, uh, privately uh, to talk about them, I'm happy to do that. All right, so little by little, uh, I'm working through it. Because uh, these are online, it's a little different. If I give out paper exams, everyone gets them back to the same time. These, with Blackboard, as soon as I'm finished grading it, you can go see it. So it's a little different. That's right. We're beginning now uh, the, the second third of the class. And as we can see from looking at the map today, what we're going to be doing is returning to India. Uh, and uh, really, in some sense, we're returning to India at a period in which, uh, as for the purpose of historians, uh, is a time period that we know a lot more about. So, in fact, we had said for the earliest period of Indian history, um, one of the great frustrations that we face as historians is we do not have as many sources as we would like. Uh, and uh, what we're going to see today, that uh, the historical documentation in India really begins to ramp up. Uh, and it's actually no accident that this is going to happen uh, as we get a new government, as we get a stronger monarchy. And often what ends up happening is that the more uh, monarchy you have, uh, the more sources you have. So the two of them actually come together. Can I say something again? Yeah. All right. The founder of this new government that I've been alluding to and really, uh, the founder uh, of what's known as the Maurya dynasty, the new family that would wrest control of India, uh, is known as Chandragupta Maurya. Uh, and uh, the reason, of course, I'm showing you uh, these feet is because we really don't know what Chandragupta Maurya looked like. Uh, but in India, it's actually a common thing uh, that, in some cases, to commemorate where someone once stood, they'll actually put these little feet. The picture is obviously a human feet, but supposedly Chandragupta Maria was here uh, at some point in the past. Um, so far as we can tell, Chandragupta Maria, um, his story actually goes back to the story of the British and then the story of Alexander the Great. Legend has it that when he was young, he actually saw Alexander the Great in action, fighting uh, in India. Who, as we said, that was one of the last places he fought before he stopped his expansion. And uh, as well, supposedly what happened, Chandragupta Maurya saw Alexander and said to himself, if he can do that and create this vast empire uh, outside of India, why can't I do that inside of India, also force this empire by conquest? Uh, and uh, as the plan he tries to put into effect later in his life. Uh, we, uh, so far as we can tell, Chandragupta Maria uh, seizes the throne, um, and then he begins to, uh, he begins to first to unify the area of northern, uh, of northern India before he can go any further. Uh, and in fact, northern India, as we said, is the area that uh, really uh, was one of the richest parts of India, uh, and uh, really, in some ways, the easiest to conquer. Especially that the areas we've talked about already, in part, the Indus River Valley, uh, which still, agriculturally speaking, is very uh, rich, and uh, an area we haven't talked about, the Ganges Basin, uh, here in uh, the northeast, which also, again, is another of these regions uh, that have a lot of good agriculture. So those are the areas he first seizes with this military. Um, we also know, by the way, uh, that he begins to build up things uh, as a king one. He begins to build palaces, for instance, uh, all of which were built in wood, so we don't actually have any of them anymore, but uh, initially we would have. We also, at this point, we think that uh, Chandragupta Maria begins to create the first time a, a bureaucracy, ministers who serve him, officials who serve him. Uh, and it does appear that in the works already was this great conquest of the rest of India, uh, while Chandragupta was, uh, was still alive. Uh, unfortunately for him, uh, he ends up dying uh, a relatively young death. 
And uh, what this means at this point is that he can never actually complete his conquest. And so it is left to his son uh, to, uh, to do the conquest that he had planned. And his son, uh, somewhat ruined statue, but I have someone's remembered um, artwork, but you can see this is his son, Ashuka. Ashuka, we think, uh, like his father, was a military man. And upon coming into control of India, taking the throne, he begins to, uh, it really is this vast conquest of India. You shouldn't think of India as being a unified nation at this point. It had to be unified. And the way to do that was through blood. And Ashuka begins this incredibly violent campaign, of, which we know from his own words, uh, and essentially begins to mow down all sorts of natives. And uh, just to show you how, um, how different this campaign is from the modern conquest, you may think uh, that uh, this process was easy if you had a, a large army just to get to these people to conquer them. But in fact, uh, many of the areas of India previously did not have a lot of contact with outsiders at this point. And so just getting to um, the natives to be able to kill them was a difficult process. Uh, and so his men had to, for instance, carry around essentially machetes and cut down forests uh, as they went down be able to get to the next people who had to conquer. This is really a long, tiring, and ultimately fairly bloody conquest of uh, almost all of India. Uh, and uh, we really see that um, in addition to just taking a lot of territory, uh, Mashuka begins to splash up propaganda. Um, this is, for instance, this is the uh, uh, the sign of his royal house that he begins to put up on columns, this uh, lion, which today is still one of the symbols of, uh, uh, of India, based upon this, uh, you know, this ancient uh, kingdom. Uh, and uh, he begins to put up all sorts of monuments uh, around uh, India. Uh, and he also begins to uh, take uh, to learn lessons from outsiders that one of the things you're supposed to do as a king uh, is to create law. And uh, he actually begins to put up uh, all of these uh, inscriptions that have laws on them, on some of the monuments he has. Uh, and uh, the very weird part, and this is something, of course, we have seen before uh, law that had been put you know, up publicly. Uh, and we know that uh, Persians and Greeks had done this. This is probably where he gets the idea. And we, in fact, know about the influence of the Greeks and that, uh, uh, a bizarre as it may seem, uh, Ashuka actually, part of his laws were inscribed in Greek, a language that uh, virtually nobody spoke in India. Because uh, he learned that that is how you do law, you write it in Greek. Uh, they provided a translation of the language that people could actually read. So very, sort of really showing his influences very clearly. Um, Ashuka begins now to create a much larger bureaucracy of the government, all very clearly uh, delineated by caste, the caste system. He creates a huge army, which is very well administered. Um, he begins to promote literacy only because then he needs people to be able to staff his administration. Um, he creates spies to make sure that all these regions that are over him are doing what they say they're doing. Uh, other things that governments do, he taxes people, he creates better roads, he creates irrigation projects for agriculture, all of these things that we've seen before. And this is looking now like a, uh, you know, really a well-functioning machine that government. He even begins to uh, maintain diplomacy with places outside of India, so you know, the established government. We don't have a huge amount physically left over from Ashuka's reign. Occasionally, we get, for instance, you can see this, this gold actually, I think, dates to his reign. Um, an occasional piece of art, but again, obviously it's not too impressive, uh, in terms of preservation. One of the things we do have, it's actually a very interesting thing, is that uh, one thing that comes with the United Monarchy is one currency now. And he begins to produce a coinage. Which, as you can see, if you look closely, you can actually see uh, um, the elephant uh, in, in the currency. If you look very closely here, you can also, this is uh, not well preserved, it's an elephant uh, inside of some of the Shuka's currency. So. 
Uh, occasionally, so we have some uh, statues left over from the spring, not a huge amount altogether. I always like these ones because they look like modern art, so, uh, as you can see um, they're Really, uh, it's some very abstract. Um, most people tend to think that there was a fundamental weakness with the Shupas government, even as uh, building up all of these features of government. Uh, and um, it was already problematic while Shuka was alive. After he was dead, it became impossible to manage this government anymore. Uh, and uh, really, um, one of the basic problems was that um, they really had never created very strong institutions of government. People hadn't lived long enough for the government to care much about it. Uh, and um, for that reason, uh, we don't think very often that the people chosen for these positions, like tax collectors, were people who were competent. They were only people who were favorites of the king or favorites of the king's family. So in some cases, you've got people who had no idea what they were doing uh, or, or just totally corrupt. The deeper problem, though, with this sort of lack of attachment or love for government uh, was that when government runs into problems, there's no one rushing out to try to save it because the, they really, the Indians are not accustomed to having government in their midst. Uh, and uh, so they basically let it go. I mean, the, this is not to say that people didn't have um, institutions they cared about. They cared about their families, they cared about the caste they were in. Government, though, was a new creature, and so when government struggled, uh, government could be sacrificed. There was. We all, uh, eventually, uh, the other problem sometimes people say is that um, we do think that the caste system that we talked about previously um, really provided an impediment for uh, ambitious people because there's only so high that a low-born person could actually go in this, this system. Um, they could not really advance very high. Altogether, uh, what this means is that um, you get this stronger and stronger sort of um, um, difficulties in the government until ultimately it weakens. Uh, and um, as you go on, the last Moran emperors become worse and worse uh, until the point where, um, in essence, uh, uh, the last Moran emperor is uh, assassinated. And uh, there's really no one waiting uh, to take his place. The other problem this creates is that once you, a united monarchy begins to fall, uh, the same problems we've seen uh, in pretty much a really deeper history uh, in India. These invasions coming from the northwest, they just begin to, uh, to, to happen again. And there's no strong army to counter them anymore. Uh, so this brings new people in, but it also means uh, that it also creates chaos for some people who live in the north. For those of you who are big fans of empire, however, you will be happy to know that after this long period of chaos, there is a return to united imperial government. So you get another experiment to having big government in India. And this is uh, the second of the two dynasties we're talking about, the Gupta Empire. Uh, shown here, the, the, uh, the extent of the territory under their control. The Guptas were again based in the north, uh, in the Ganges Basin, uh, so in the area that in fact is one of the most agriculturally rich regions of India. Uh, and uh, um, what's very interesting to us about the Guptas uh, as an empire uh, is that um, they, a lot of their um, power comes from the ability to use resources very wisely. Um, they were rich. Uh, they had very good connections. Uh, they were able to bring together a lot of the different important families together. Uh, and um, in some cases, too, they had enough of an army uh, that they could actually take and hold some important regions in, in India. And in fact, threaten some of those areas uh, that um, they didn't choose to conquer directly. Essentially, you pay us money or we will destroy it uh, was enough of uh, incentive for, for most areas to give them money. Uh, but you'll notice even by um, even by the, the map here, um, the territory under control of the Guptas was not as great uh, as the first dynasty of uh, the Maria dynasty. And that in part, in part is because we don't think that the Guptas fought when they didn't have to. And if they could actually have an area that was not directly controlled by them, they were happy by that, so long as they got their money. Uh, so there's a much looser control over India. 
on the any land that they had directly, they really didn't want to worry about day-to-day -day matters. They just wanted to worry about um, adding to their coffers. Now, again, um, you know, being rich is good. Uh, on the whole, um, we do think that the dust has become very good at things like, for instance, mining, gold and silver mining. Uh, and you can actually even see the coins that they produce. They're really these, in some cases, these uh, wonderful coins that show just how much money they had at their disposal. Uh, here's a, a, a gun to end for running for going to battle. We also think that the Guptas open their doors open wide for trade. There are lots of merchants who come into India at this period. Here's a silver coin. And altogether, too, we, uh, the, the tendency with the Guptas uh, is they really praised how luxurious their society was on the whole, how much money they had. And, uh, in fact, um, just to give you just one sign of how much money and uh, leisure time they had at their disposal, um, in fact, the Gupta court, uh, supposedly, this is the place where chess was invented for the first time. They had so much free time on their hands uh, that they had to create chess as a way just to sort of do something uh, in the meantime to amuse themselves. Um, we think that um, while all of this system was working under the Dutch Empire. In fact, this was not a terrible system altogether. We think that the Dutch is by leaving a lot of the work of government into local hands and really uh, just trying their best to stabilize things and keep all these families alive to one another. Uh, what this meant was uh, this system could function, uh, but and, uh, and its height it does bring peace and prosperity. Now, the great problem that the Guptas, though, never really managed to solve as a, as a dynasty uh, is that uh, they really never come up with a very strong military uh, on their own. And they really have no way to coordinate a military response in the case of invasion. And this is something that they should have been able to anticipate, but they did not. And so what ends up happening is that um, when they do actually experience a major invasion from the north, um, a group of people who um, um, there's actually debated who exactly these invaders were. Uh, the group uh, that the group that invaded is probably a group known as the Huns. We'll talk about later on. The Huns really uh, have a period of time where they they uh, they invade China, they invade uh, India, and eventually they'll hit Rome as well. So they're uh, equal opportunity invaders. Yeah. Or are those the same ones that Mulan took face off of? Yes, yeah, exactly. Same, same group, exactly. And, and it, we'll talk about later the contact with China, but in fact, the Huns ended up attacking several people, not simultaneously, but one after the next. The big problem then is once uh, the, the Dutch emperors are faced by this, uh, this tremendous invasion, uh, they are caught flat footed. They, their army is too strong, uh, too weak, really, to actually respond. Uh, and uh, when they, to actually raise an army, it costs them so much money that it actually ends up bankrupting the state entirely. They have no more money left. Um, and uh, the other problem this creates is that when they finally respond to the Huns and manage to push them out further to the west, uh, part of the difficulty is that all of these smaller sub-kingdoms, or these areas that had been made alliances with them, no longer wanted to have anything to do with the Gupta emperors, because they were unable to actually guarantee safety. So why would people want to uh, acknowledge them? And they, they stopped sending them money, because they're not afraid of them anymore. What ends up happening then is this slow process of unraveling of the government. Um, regional families begin to usurp the power that theoretically the Gupta emperors have, uh, and uh, they, in fact, they stop acknowledging any emperor at all. And uh, well, you can just to show how this process works, in some of our later sources, we don't even know some of the later Gupta emperors' names because they were so unimportant altogether uh, when we care about them. So the end result of uh, this second dynasty is the same as the first, which is to say uh, that India has a brief experiment with a strong monarchy and a best uh, and unravels. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that Indians give up on government entirely. Uh, they do 
Uh, there's constantly um, people who say, well, I want to bring back the empire or you know, bring back the United Government. But it's virtually impossible to do. There's no, uh, uh, so what you see instead is very small, limited regional kingdoms. That's about it. Uh, and so it's not really until uh, uh, the 19th century when the British come that you actually see India reunited again. Uh, as strongly as it had been in this period. All right, I want to turn back uh, to the Maria emperors for one minute to, to talk about one aspect of their rule that I've entirely left out so far, and that is a question of official ideology or even religion uh, that motivates them. Uh, one of the things that has uh, may have puzzled you when you looked at the map earlier of the conquest of Shuka was that, um, if you want to, I can Where are we? All right. And uh, here. Good. You'll notice uh, that he actually does not take all of what today is modern day India. Uh, he actually leaves this small bit to his death. And the question we have is uh, why? You know, why not just take it all? We certainly had the military capability to do so. And the answer to this is actually a, a very somewhat surprising turn of events uh, midway through Ashuka's great conquest. It appears that Ashuka got involved with so many of these extremely violent, bloody battles that the cost in human life actually begins to horrify Ashuka in a very interesting way. Uh, and in fact, it's, it appears that this was when he decides to convert, uh, not to Hinduism, which he had been previously a Hindu, uh, but he chooses to convert to the minority faith in India, Buddhism. Uh, which, as we mentioned earlier, Buddhism has very good answers to questions about, you know, what do you do with human suffering? Uh, and uh, in fact, he, he really appears that Shukla was very attracted by these. Uh, and that uh, we can. One of the reasons why we know so much about this new uh, newfound sort of devotion to uh, Buddhism uh, is that Shuka begins to put these things up in addition to his other monuments. I know what you're saying, that you, this just looks like a rock. And in fact, that's exactly what it is. But if you were to look very closely, more closely than we'll do here, uh, what you'll see is that this rock has all sorts of writing on it. This is a rock in scripture, a rock edict uh, that has uh, really, this entire new social program uh, that Ashuka has, based upon his new Buddhist beliefs. Uh, and uh, again, really, in some senses, I mean, these are highly idealistic documents about the same things like, for instance, um, we have to uh, make sure to show dignity and respect to all living creatures. Um, we have to show religious tolerance, which in a place like India, uh, where there were all sorts of different sort of local beliefs circulating, actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have to promote a culture of non-violence, which again appears ironic given how much violence he had done up until this point. Um, and in fact, some of these descriptions say we should not only not kill humans, uh, but we shouldn't even kill animals, which would have appeared bizarre to Hindu priests because sacrifice was one of their main uh, their main rituals. Uh, so it appears. Uh, and odds with that. Um, it, some people have suggested uh, that uh, at least one of the reasons that Shuka chooses to embrace um, the Buddhist faith is that it provides some measure of social unity or harmony. Some of these teachings seem to say that you know, everyone should get along. Uh, but uh, it really is remarkable, though, that if he was going to choose one religion, he would choose religion that really a, only a small sliver of people in India were actually worshipping at the time. But uh, it does appear that um, he does actually put his money where his mouth is. He not only does uh, practice his Buddhism himself, uh, but he also begins to put up uh, areas that um, are kind of like Buddhist retreats. Uh, areas in which, um, for instance, you get, there'll be shade, uh, there'll be wells to take water, um, there'll be places to sort of sit under trees and meditate. So uh, theoretically, you should be able to help people to gain uh, nirvana. Uh, and uh, uh, he also, uh, this is actually, I showed you this temple earlier in the class, but this temple uh, is uh, a temple that was erected by Ashuka that is meant to commemorate the place in which Buddha was said himself to have achieved enlightenment, achieved nirvana. So because that's important. Uh, 
event for a Buddhist. You can imagine for many Buddhist monks who were accustomed really to being a small minority in India, this was a heyday. Uh, and um, they really begin now that the, they're actually having both support and bankrolling by the emperor. They're getting out on the streets and trying to convert as many people as possible to Buddhism. And uh, we think that um, Buddhist monks really, in some sense, had a great advantage in doing this. Some of you have, uh, again, you've been reading through some of the language of Hindu sources, and you'll notice how difficult it is to understand a lot of them. Things like the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, which were intentionally meant to be difficult to get you to contemplate. Uh, but it's very difficult to sell someone a religion that um, really they, they don't understand. Uh, and um, we think Buddhist monks were smart enough to go out into the streets and speak to people in a language that they didn't actually understand. Much simpler form of language than the uh, Hindu priests. And so, in fact, Buddhism, uh, which in some ways, again, is really a very difficult religion. I mean, meditation and achieving nirvana is not for everybody, but it didn't matter. Buddhism actually begins to flower in India for the first time. We actually begin to get uh, more and more adherence. And in fact, um, one of the other things that Shuka begins to bankroll is more and more Buddhist missionaries going out. Or I told you that eventually Buddhism becomes a world religion. This is really a big key of, uh, moment in that, where lots of uh, Buddhist monks now will go and travel to East Asia uh, with Ashuka giving them the funds to be able to take those journeys. this, of course, um, seemed very good to those people who were Buddhist, the minority. But the majority, though, religion for Hinduism, you can imagine how this seemed to be a bit of a catastrophe, uh, and that they were actually losing adherence. And uh, in fact, what we're going to see now is that there's a conscious response from Hindu priests to try their best to work against uh, the spread of Buddhism and to win people back. Uh, to uh, Hinduism instead of majority religion. So what do they do exactly? Well, one of the first things that we make Hindu priests begin to do is promote the cult of a new god uh, who was meant to be relatable to humans. Uh, I'll take a step back in a moment and introduce you to this god here. Uh, this is the Hindu god known as Vishnu. Vishnu is an enormously powerful god. Uh, in fact, one of those it, it gods is said to be one of the creators of the world in Hinduism. Uh, sometimes referred to one of the, the gods who basically keeps the world uh, preserved, keeps it going. But a god so immense in power, so removed from human experience, that he was very difficult for people to really worship and engage with. He was just too, uh, too different from people. Not so, however, with this god who was created during this period, who first is, is mentioned during this period. This is the god Krishna. Uh, uh, now, um, the reason why I spent all this time talking uh, about Vishnu was because, uh, and this is the connection between the two gods, Krishna is seen to be a human incarnation of the god Vishnu, sort of a human form of this much greater god. The, the reason why I, I'm talking about this is because we think Krishna was meant to be a god who could really, in some sense, be venerated much more easily by human beings. Uh, yeah, is she a goddess? Uh, no, uh, a, a god, exactly. About a, a male god, yes. Yeah. Um, so a, although he takes a human form, he's also, he remains a god. Okay. Krishna, I mean, the real reason people love to tell stories about him is he has this, he's given all these uh, characteristics of human beings. Uh, he's known, for instance, as you can see here, he's an entertainer who plays a, a, a flute. Uh, he is someone who is, he actually sometimes will play pranks or tricks on people, uh, his own uh, uh, adherents, his own believers. Uh, he's also known to be a lover as well, at least stories of him uh, sort of involved with, with women. Uh, and really, um, part of the reason behind this 
all of this is that Krishna is meant to be a god uh, that really could engage with. He was more human in scope than a god like Vishnu, who's just too powerful. And in fact, Krishna actually does become wildly popular uh, as a god. Another way uh, that the Hindu priests work to try to win people back is by, for the first time, beginning to commit some of their oral epics. Stories now that have been told for centuries, but now they begin to commit them to writing for the first time. And again, this shouldn't be a surprise to you, of course, the people love epics. In the Greek world, too, we saw this process, right? People love to tell stories of the distant past. And India was just the same. Uh, but the, the, what's really important here is that as these stories begin to take a written form, as a sort of canonical form, um, the priests begin to insert messages that essentially support the ideas of Hinduism or, or any other religion. Uh, so they're written down with a particular focus in mind. I'll give you an example. One of the great epic stories from ancient India is known as the Mahabharata. Uh, this is one old image of the Mahabharata. Uh, essentially, the Mahabharata tells is an epic tale that tells uh, the story of this clash in northern India, so the area of the money is, between two groups of cousins for who will control uh, the area. And there's just a constant a sort of talks about different battles uh, that occur. Uh, very long work. So far as we can tell, as the Mahabharata had been circulated traditionally, this was not a story that had really anything to do with religion. It's a secular war school from a ripping good yarn of, of, uh, of soldiers fighting with other soldiers. When Hindu priests begin to devote, uh, begin to commit this text to writing, uh, we really think now uh, that and you begin to see this frequent and intervention by gods. Gods are all over the place now. And we think in an artificial sense. Uh, gods like Vishnu and Krishna all of a sudden become major players uh, in this uh, work. And uh, again, the point is very simple. If you are virtuous and you call upon the help of the Hindu gods, they will come to save you in war or any other endeavor. Uh, which, of course... Uh, really reinforces the message that Hinduism has the right answers, right? Uh, or else you won't get the help you need. This is a little bit confusing, uh, but there's another, a second work that is, is written during this period that's kind of an addendum, that's sort of just tacked onto the Mahabharata that never used to exist. It's a new poem, uh, but uh, it begins to circulate with the Mahabharata. Uh, this is one of the other great masterpieces in the literature known as the Bhagavad Gita, a term that means the song of the Lord. And the Lord, in this case, that it refers to, uh, is this guy here. This is uh, Krishna, who's in blue. So you see again and again, Krishna is playing a big part uh, in, these, uh, in these tales. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, the, uh, it's a very, it's a kind of a, uh, it's a very interesting poem. It was written probably by several hands, uh, but it really becomes the sort of one of the essential uh, sort of texts of Hinduism in this time period. The basic storyline is the following: um, what, what you end up getting is Krishna, who actually is a charioteer, he's driving the chariot. Uh, this person here, who's in the warrior caste, and uh, he is uh, he's supposed to be taking part in these battles. Um, the person in the warrior caste is hesitant to go into battle. And then Krishna launches into this defense of why he must fight, and ultimately convinces him to do so. Uh, and uh, we think that Krishna tells him, uh, argues, for instance, that um, the soul is eternal. So even if you die, your body, then your soul continues to live on. Uh, he also, Krishna argues, that listen, everyone has a part in the caste system. You are a warrior. Therefore, as a warrior, you have no choice but to fight. That is what your job is. Uh, Krishna also says, eventually, that, uh, you know, listen, I'm a god, and you're supposed to follow the wisdom of the gods, not your own wisdom, right? So I'm telling you to fight, so you have no choice uh, but to go to fight. Uh, so all 
always are arguments that would have been very, um, again, would have been logical to someone who's already a Hindu. I imply, in fact, that uh, you know, this, is, this is the correct way to act. Altogether, too, there's the, an underlying theme uh, in uh, the Mahabharata. It's um, you really should love Krishna. In fact, uh, any works that you do uh, in devotion to him are, uh, are, are good acts, are meritorious acts. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the more you attach yourself to Krishna when he tells you, the more you get happiness eventually. Various things with Krishna. Okay, right. the third tale, and I promise this is the last one, um, that the Hindu priests begin to write down during this period is another of, of these sort of great masterpieces of Hindu literature. Another very long one, uh, known as the Ramayana. The Ramayana is, again, another of these stories that we do not think started its life as having anything to do with religion. It is a secular story. And it is about um, this guy here, known as Prince Rama. So Ramayana comes from his name. The story is about Rama. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, the, the whole story is about um, this prince who had a, this happy life uh, until this demon king came along and kidnapped his wife. And so uh, this is part of a love story and part of an adventure story. He has to, after the kidnapping by the demon king, he has to go through this long series of adventures and battles, and finally he manages the end to win back his wife. Uh, just because everyone always asks, um, this is the demon king. Uh, and uh, the monkeys are actually allies of Prince Rama. They're fighting on his side, which we tell against the demons. Um, um, so far as we can tell, the Ramayana in its original version is really was this kind of exciting story uh, that had all these sort of like you know, all these sort of great fights and everything. That's part of the reason why people love it so much. As Hindu priests, though, in this period, begin to work on this story, um, what they do is they begin to infuse all sorts of Hindu values into it. Uh, so, for instance, um, the, Rama and his wife now are not just meant to be just normal individuals, but they're meant to be models for behavior of how a Hindu couple uh, should behave, ideally, in a marriage. So they're meant to be sort of models of excellence. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, even in times of difficulty, Prince Rama, as the ideal husband, is supposed to listen to his wife, he's supposed to, you know, try to help her out of these problems that she has, uh, of course, to save her in times of distress. Uh, uh, another thing, too, is again, um, uh, they begin to, and this is sort of um, something that we haven't seen necessarily in other religions, uh, but certainly was a feature of Hinduism. Um, um, sexuality and sensuality, which in some traditions, of course, is seen to be you know, very sort of distinct from, uh, from proper religious practice. Um, that's actually not the case in Hinduism, and though they uh, often talk about how. Um, Sexuality can actually be a, a means to be able to achieve uh, spiritual excellence. Uh, and in fact, um, they, that's part of the reason why there, there's all these sort of sex scenes uh, between uh, Prince Rama and, and his wife, because they're supposed to show you how you're able to use sensuality uh, as a means to achieve spirituality. So the, another one of those ways in which they become the models uh, for behavior. We think that all together, this uh, sort of process that I'm telling you about, uh, this process now of in which uh, the, all of these sort of uh, uh, Hindu stories begin to uh, uh, be written down and circulate, is ultimately very successful, as is the god Krishna. And it actually begins to lead all sorts of people uh, back uh, to Hinduism. And so in fact, um, it's actually quite interesting that we said the Maurya emperors uh, who are big time devotees of Buddhism. But that changes gears completely uh, during uh, the, the, uh, the second dynasty, the Gupta the dynasty. And the Guptas begin now to put all their money uh, to building Hindu uh, temples and supporting Hindu priests, not Buddhist monks any longer. Um, and so what we begin to see then is uh, the Guptas uh, begin, in some cases, uh, to do the same sorts of things that uh, uh, previously had been done for Buddhist monks. Give them money 
uh, for land, give them money for missionary work, um, give them and create an educational system, a limited educational system, but still an educational system uh, that really above all else uh, implies that Hinduism is the greatest faith and that is the basis for all lessons within uh, the, the schools that they had within India uh, after this. Uh, so, uh, the upshot of all this is another uh, temple. Uh, the upshot of all of this uh, is um, that, that brief period in the sun where it actually appears uh, that uh, Buddhism was actually beginning to make uh, inroads against Hinduism in India. That's gone. Uh, and uh, in fact, that will be the, really the last time uh, that Buddhism will seriously ever challenge Hinduism uh, in India, in its, its birthplace. Uh, and after that point, what we really see is a dwindling again of Buddhism to a, a small minority of people. Um, and uh, and it really, in some ways, that's how it's lasted until today. Oh. I, I've talked a lot about now, again, the sort of political and religious backdrop. Uh, and uh, I do want to, though, at the very end, talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the economic and cultural sort of life that's taking place in India uh, during the period of these two empires. Uh, and uh, the first thing I'd like to dispel, and I know I talk a lot in India uh, about the presence of outsiders as usually being something that violent. It is fair to say, though, uh, that that is not always the case. Uh, and uh, in fact, what we're going to see during this period is that uh, first of all, India's uh, economy as a whole is going to flourish, and we're also going to you know, begin to see all sorts of peaceful contacts with outsiders beginning to grow up, uh, especially on the economic scene uh, in India. So, especially at some of the, the times in which these empires that we talked about were strongest, what we begin to see in India is on many different levels a strong economy. Agriculture blooms in the north very well. Uh, they get a lot of agricultural growth, harvest. And uh, as we've seen before, of course, um, one of the benefits of having, uh, having agricultural growth is it gives you good money then to be able to build up your culture. Uh, and um, you don't have a lot of things that are preserved from this period in India, uh, but we do know uh, that um, you would have seen this whole array of different items that were available for sale. Uh, pots were produced on large, uh, large numbers. Uh, clothing, uh, tools, metal tools begin to become much more common in India. Uh, but none of these things, though, uh, were things that tended to be traded. Uh, because they're, they're really, uh, if you're going to trade items in the pre modern world, uh, they have to be worth enough money to travel them over long distances. Uh, but don't worry. India also had that, too. Uh, India actually begins to develop a luxury industry. Uh, these sort of high items and sort of things that can be traded in part to high rollers within India and in part outside of India, too. You can see international trade uh, beginning to grow up with India at the center. Um, and uh, really, in, in many cases, um, some of the other uh, civilizations we've seen or will see uh, begin at this period uh, increasingly to put India on their maps. Uh, places like China, uh, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all of them will actually begin to come to India in large numbers, and in turn, some Indian traders will begin to travel out to them. Uh, and uh, this is in part because, um, uh, again, some of those sort of high, uh, high ticket items, um, metals, Gold, silver get traded in large numbers outside of India during this period. Um, jewelry, based upon uh, those uh, uh, that was created in India, and then was sold abroad or sold to uh, international traders who flowed into India as well. Um, things like, for instance, uh, the cotton plant begins to be produced in large numbers in India, which means that they can produce more clothing. In some cases, fine clothing. Um, the other th one of the other things uh, that uh, India becomes known for are gems. Again, of course, this is in part uh, uh, connected to the jewelry trade. Uh, some of the best gems in the world can be mined and were mined in India during this period. Another thing that uh, Indians are known for, and in fact would be known for for the entire pre-modern period, are spices. 
again, uh, it maybe it's hard for us to believe the time you just go to the market and get any kind of spices you want to, uh, that many spices, especially things like pepper, you could not get them easily. Uh, you have to actually travel long distances up to India uh, to be able to get them in the first place. Uh, and uh, India had a lot of these hot spices in abundance. And uh, what this meant, too, uh, altogether, was that now India becomes, uh, again, such major, major traders uh, that um, they can begin to get things from other places uh, that otherwise uh, they didn't have, they had limited numbers within India. Uh, horses uh, come in. Uh, silk from places like China actually becomes become a, an ordinary item among the upper class in India. And in fact, what this means is that especially for merchants, many merchants made out like bandits, um, many merchants actually become some of the richest uh, people within India at this time from all this trade. Now, you may see that, of course, as an unambiguously good thing. Uh, Indians at the time were not totally sure about it. Uh, and part of the problem was that uh, we already talked about the caste system earlier and how traders were not at the top of the social ladder in India. Merchants were not. Um, for instance, uh, warriors were supposed to be far above merchants. But that was a real problem now because merchants were so rich that in many cases they were much richer than people who were their betters. Uh, people who were higher than them on the caste system, which created a huge amount of disruption and hate merchants of people who were in other castes. Um, there was a lot of tension that goes up. Uh, and so um, in some cases, the only possibility that merchants had, they recognized that, um, again, because of hate that was felt by sometimes these other castes, especially the ones who were bubbling in particular, uh, that they begin to break off into their own little sub-societies within India and regulate many of their matters by themselves because they felt they had no choice uh, or else that they would face prejudice from the outside. The centers of these new kind of mini-societies that merchants uh, begin to uh, come up with uh, are things called guilds. And these are guilds. The guilds also occur in other civilizations. They're akin to us, to like modern-day unions, uh, in that uh, people who were in a similar uh, job, uh, occupation, usually merchants, also some of the artisans who were creating the high-end things that merchants were selling, like jewelry, they themselves would form their own guild, uh, people who did the same job. Uh, and in part, that was just to regulate the profession, but guilds actually become much larger than modern-day unions in that um, they're meant, they actually become this sort of social sort of network. Uh, people who were part of the same guild, they lived in the same area, they socialize with one another, they marry one another's, uh, into one another's family, they married off their daughters. Um, they took, they were meant to take care of people uh, in their area who had ran into problems with needy uh, as well. And, Really, in a little kind of a strong government, it was very often a guild who would take care of some judicial problems when people got into arguments, uh, court cases. They did those things too. Um, uh, so they're really doing community affairs as well. The other thing that guilds do too is that, again, that when anyone who breaks the rules in terms of how you do your job or really how you live your life, because these are really all encompassing, all encompassing. Uh, in some cases, the guild can also kick people out, which essentially is like a social exclusion as well as exclusion from doing the job. So they're really very powerful people who run the guild in many cases. Nevertheless, um, although we've been talking a lot about some of the positive trends happening in the economy, uh, it is fair to say that not everything uh, is positive. Uh, and I told you that, uh, again, uh, even in, in uh, ancient India, since the time of the Aryans, uh, there had been a tendency uh, for the India to really be uh, male-focused or sort of a patriarchy being uh, dominant. Uh, and in fact, in this period, um, in some cases, uh, women's lives uh, actually get uh, worse. There are even more rigid uh, attitudes towards the position of women's society uh, become very common uh, towards the way to subjugate women. Uh, one sign of this, for instance, uh, is that um, um, we begin to see, for instance, uh, that child marriage uh, becomes very common, uh, even more common than we think it had been previously in India. 
uh, that you know, women are married off, well, actually before they're women, um, they're married off at very young ages, with really no input from uh, them. Um, the other thing, and this is again to, for some people is a little more sort of difficult to deal with an uh, expression of this same impulse, uh, is this practice known as sati. Um, the, the attitude uh, in this period often became in India that women were extensions of their husbands, uh, and uh, after their husband died, there was very little need to have the women continue to exist on their own. Uh, and so, in some cases, um, the attitude became that actually it was a good thing for widows, uh, rather than to continue to live, um, when their husbands were being burnt on the pyre, being cremated, um, it was thought good that they would just leap on the pyre themselves then, uh, and essentially um, be, be burnt to death um, along with their husband. Uh, you should not necessarily think of all the trends in India uh, that is a uh, time period for possible. All right. Well, I'm not sure enough. Um, I'll see you next time. Thank you.